Oregon has ranked high in, in cleanliness or lack of corruption simply because Oregon doesn't have laws against corruption. <laughs> it's, corruption is legal in Oregon. Corruption, what would be considered corruption in 47 other states, uh -huh. is legal in Oregon. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy, and also to create a true democracy. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Dan Meek. Dan is a public interest attorney here in Portland who is well known for his advocacy of and use of the initiative process uh, for having written measures 46 and 47 on the 2006 ballot for limiting campaign contributions and expenditures as well as establishing other requirements for political campaigns. He is also known for having sued private utilities for, among other things, collecting taxes from ratepayers and then not actually paying the taxes to the state of Oregon. So, uh, welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, David. And right. the utilities also were not paying the, their income taxes to the federal government either. Yes, I was sure that I was telling only part of yes, the story. Only, but <laughs> right, yeah. Only part. Uh, are, are they paying their taxes now? Good question. Um, I'm, they're, they both of the major private utilities in Oregon, Pacific Power and Light and Portland General Electric, have started what are called general rate cases. And so I will get involved in those and do discovery and find out whether they're actually paying the income taxes that they're charging to rate payers. Okay. Oregon, in 2005, the Oregon legislature actually passed a law forbidding them from charging rate payers for income taxes they don't pay. But in its infinite wisdom, the Oregon legislature in 2011 repealed that law. <laughs> okay, so I, I think this sounds like another opportunity for you to come back uh, later and update us on okay. this. Okay, all right. Okay, great, yeah. Today, uh, I'm hoping that you'll update us a little bit more on campaign finance reform laws in Oregon. Uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, you wrote marriages 46 and 47. Um, 46 failed, uh, 47 passed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it established um, reasonable limits on campaign contributions and expenditures on Oregon races. Um, it was never, in, it has not been enforced by the Oregon Secretary of State or Attorney General, and we're still in court uh, on attempting to force them to do that. They don't, they don't have, I believe, the authority not to enforce it, and that remains under reconsideration at the Oregon Supreme Court. Okay. So, is the Oregon Legislature currently doing anything with regard to limiting campaign contributions or expenditures? Um, well. Let's look back at their history. Has, have they ever done anything <laughs> to limit campaign contributions and expenditures since Oregon became a state in 1859? Oh, I, off the top of my head, I would say no. No, they have not. Right. Um, the Oregon voters have uh, four times enacted limits on campaign contributions or expenditures, and the Oregon legislature has repealed the, repealed the ones that were in effect in 1973, and then the, or, the Oregon Supreme Court struck down the ones that were enacted, the two sets that were enacted in 1994. And the, um, as for the ones that, that Oregon voters enacted in 2006, Measure 47, as I mentioned, this, the, that's still in litigation, and so we don't know the outcome of that. But for this session of the legislature, like every other session, no, they're doing nothing to limit campaign contributions or expenditures, leaving Oregon as one of only three states with no limits. And as slide two indicates, we now have an update for the amount of spending on legislative races uh, through 2012. And you can see how much it has increased. It's increased from about $3 million for all races put together in 1996 up to about $27 million for 2012. Um, slide two, three indicates that the spending on governor's races for governor has increased uh, at about the same rate. Of course, no governor's race in 2012. Mm -hmm. Slide four shows that the winners of uh, how much money is spent even for, for little house races. These are races for the Oregon House. There are 60 of them every two years. Uh, typically, they are won with about 11 or 12,000 votes. And now, in 2010, the winners of contested house races spent up to $590,000 each on their campaigns and typically spent 400000 or more. The average spending by the top 20 candidates was 384000 now, if you don't think that was high enough, then in 2012, those numbers went up substantially. The winners of contested House races, indicating on slide five, spent up to $853,000, and the average spending by the top 20 candidates was $519,000. That's in order to get about 11,000 votes. Hmm. So it's about $50 per vote, which leaves Oregon as the, um, 
as the second most expensive state in America for winning a, a legislative race. The only state where per capita spending on legislative races is higher uh, in, than Oregon is New Jersey. New Jersey, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, New Jersey has a perception of being a very corrupt state, but Oregon doesn't. Well, that's, that's true. Um, at least it has been true in the past. In many studies that you might see uh, about you know, comparing the states on levels of corruption, uh, until very recently, all of those studies have used this, the same methodology, which is um, the researcher looks to see how many people have been convicted in each state of corruption type offenses. And if there's a high rate of high number of convictions, then the conclusion is that the state is corrupt. Uh -huh. I would argue that's exactly the opposite of the truth. That if there are if there are actually crimes, for example, if making a, a huge corporate contra corporate campaign contribution is a crime, and if it is prosecuted and to a conviction, I would say that's that state is clean, and that state in, in particular, for example, would be Texas, mm -hmm. where Tom DeLay, the former House Majority Leader of the United States, was convicted of uh, channeling $190,000 of corporate uh, money into the legislative races uh, in the state of Texas. In Oregon, of course, channeling that money is considered to be legal, and um, $190,000 is not even a drop in the bucket because, as we've just noted, to uh, Oregon legislative races are costing $27 million uh, every two years. So um, in other studies, Oregon has ranked high in, in cleanliness or lack of corruption simply because Oregon doesn't have laws against corruption. <laughs> it's, corruption is legal in Oregon. Corruption, what would be considered corruption in 47 other states, uh -huh. is legal in Oregon. Um, so I think the corruption studies um, are, are on their, stand on their heads, okay. except that there's one, been one recently, which is illustrated in slide 11, actually. So the, the solution to corruption is to get rid of the laws. The well, solution to uh, having high crime rates is to get rid of the laws. Well, that would be, that would, that's the logic of these studies. That is, if, it were le if murder were legal in Oregon, and there were lots of murders in Oregon, um, it, these studies would find that Oregon is a very safe state in terms of crime, uh, because people are not prosecuted for murder. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay. One study, uh, as slide 11 illustrates, has taken a different approach. This was the state integrity investigation by a number of organizations, including the Center for Public Integrity and Public Radio International. And they came to the opposite conclusion of the other studies. They, in fact, found that the least corrupt state was New Jersey, because New Jersey actually has laws against corruption and influence peddling and bribery, and they actually enforce those laws. It, on the other hand, gave Oregon quite low grades. It gave Oregon a D minus, for example, when it came to political financing. It gave Oregon an F when it came to uh, public access to information. A D on executive accountability. A D plus on legislative accountability. And uh, very low grades. So um, I think that, um, that there's at least one organization out there has figured out that um, uh, Maybe that, they're measuring the wrong thing. That's right. Yeah. That corruption should not be measured by, by convictions. Right. Um, it should be measured by, um, by the actual operation of state government uh, in a way that is, that is free from the influence of big money. Mm -hmm. And as uh, chart nine indicates, it's, um, this shows rather dramatically uh, where money comes from for legislative races in Oregon. And you can tell by looking at the, the left, left side of the column, uh, this shows the percentage of funds mm -hmm. and the bars, that if you eliminated all contributions to political candidates in Oregon of even $1,000 or less, it wouldn't matter much. These, um, because the contributions from individuals of $1,000 or less amount to a very small percentage. It looks like it's about 10%. Mm -hmm. of, the, of the funds that are, that are con contributed to candidates in 2008, and that the vast bulk of the money comes in contributions from individuals of $1,000 or more per individual, mm -hmm. or from what are called on the right, 73% come from non-party organizations, which is a way of saying this, this comes from the um, National Institute on Money and State Politics. It's their way of saying corporations and unions. Mm -hmm. So basically three-fourths of all the funds for candidates in Oregon come from um, corporations and unions, 
and a slide 10 indicates that three quarters of, of the money comes from uh, contributions in excess of a thousand dollars. So, so how, how would that be affected if measure 47 were actually enforced? Well, that 73% that number on the right would become zero because a measure 47 bans all corporate and union contributions. All contributions under 47 must come from individuals. Uh, in addition, for an individual in a statewide race, an individual is limited to $500 mm -hmm. to contribute to any particular campaign in a statewide race. So basically everything um, to, the, to the right of the, of the column, of the third column, which is 250 to 499, mm -hmm. everything to the right would be gone. And instead, uh, the uh, politicians would have to depend on small contributions in order to run their campaigns. Would they have any money at all? Um, yes, they would. Um, for example, when the Measure 9 of 1994 limits were in effect for one election cycle before the Oregon Supreme Court declared them to be a violation of the Oregon Constitution, um, the amount of money uh, spent in, in campaigns in Oregon did go down by about 70 percent, but then again, it, it, 30 percent of it was still there in the form of small contributions. Uh, yeah, and, and considering that Oregon elections are so expensive, you know, cutting 70 percent would not be a would not be a harmful thing. Well, cutting 70 percent would basically get you back to, um, in legislative races, for example, that would get you back to about the year 2000. Yeah, looking at so it would just cut the growth from 2000 to 2012. Uh -huh. So yeah, and I think that people were just as well informed in 2000 as they were in this last election. I or or better informed. I mean, if you if you if there wouldn't if there weren't a lot of 30 second ads on TV that make folks think that they know who the candidates are, uh, then the information that they uh -huh. learn about from um, public meetings or newspapers or uh, you know even the very few debates that are ever on, on public media, on the media in Oregon, um, they would learn more about the candidates that way. And I think without these massive contributions and without the 30 second ads, there would be greater coverage by the media. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Does, um, are there any efforts in the Oregon legislature currently to address this question? Um, there are some bills that have been introduced in the Oregon legislature, whether I would, I would call any of it an effort is um, is uh, kind of a judgment call, okay. but um, you may recall that in the last uh, campaign for Secretary of State, um, Kate Brown um, said that she would pursue in the legislature an amendment to the Oregon Constitution to ensure that Oregon can have limits on political contributions and expenditures. Unfortunately, and, and if if that were actually to pass, mm -hmm. then Measure Forty Seven would be enforceable. It would be not only enforceable; it would be in, it would be totally in effect, even under the even under adverse court rulings. Okay. Um, but that but that sort of advocacy has has not occurred. Um, some uh, what are called joint resolutions have been introduced in the Oregon Senate, which would refer to voters. Of course, in Oregon, in order to amend the Constitution, it has to be a, a decision by the voters, by referral, or by initiative. Um, so there are some joint resolutions that were introduced in the legislature to um, send to voters a, an amendment to the Constitution to explicitly allow limits on, on campaign contributions and expenditures. Those joint resolutions have not even received a hearing in the legislature. Oh, okay. And the legislature presumably is, is supposed to um, you know, wrap up by the end of June. Right, and did the Secretary of State, Kate Brown, advocate for any of these? Um, if so, it's a secret. I have not seen any anything uh -huh. in public where she has advocated for this. Okay. All right. So the Oregon legislature is kind of dead on arrival in terms of advocating or, or doing any kind of new laws that would regulate campaign contributions. Certainly any new laws that have, have any effect in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, House Joint Memorial 6, which is a um, a a memorial which asks, which requests, it sort of puts the Oregon legislature on record as making a request to the United States Congress that the United States Congress refer to the states a, uh, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to, um, to negate the, con the, the sort of the effect of the Citizens United decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in 2010 
and to negate the concept that, that corporations have um, the right of free speech and are therefore allowed to make unlimited independent expenditures. Um, that, I believe, will, that has had a hearing. It, it may go to work session soon, it may actually pass. Um, and it's certainly it's, a, it's a, a good idea, but it would have no effect whatsoever in Oregon. That is, it doesn't matter what the U.S. Constitution, well, first of all, just doing a, 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 joint, a, a joint memorial to Congress is simply asking Congress to do something. Right. In order for Congress to actually do something, there would have to have two-thirds majorities in the House and Senate to refer a constitutional amendment to the states. You would then need ratification by three quarters of the states, which seems like a which seems um, it's a hard task, a very hard task. Um, and even then, the amendment to the U.S. Constitution would have no effect on Oregon, because in Oregon, the lack of limits on contributions and expenditures is not a function of the U.S. Constitution. It's a function of our Oregon Supreme Court's interpretation of the Oregon Constitution, and that would. That would not be affected by anything mm -hmm. that that um, House Joint Memorial Six right. asks Congress to right. do. So you would need to you would need to pass this constitutional amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and then you would also need to pass a amendment to the Oregon Constitution well, in order for Measure Forty Seven to go into effect. Well, I, you wouldn't actually need an amendment to the. According to me, you don't need an amendment to the Oregon Constitution because limits are already allowed under the Oregon Constitution. Oh, but right. that's but that's as I yeah. say, still on the courts, and may, right. go, and may go either way. Right, okay, all right, good. Um, let's talk about the initiative process in Oregon. Uh, how has the initiative process changed, say, in the past 10 years? Well, it's become extremely much more difficult to qualify a measure for the ballot um, because of a, uh, a very large number of new laws and regulations making the collection of signatures a, a very technical matter and also subjecting folks who collect signatures um, and who sponsor ballot measures subject to horrendous penalties for, for technical mistakes. Um, the, for example, in the year 2000, there were nine measures on the statewide Oregon ballot that anyone would consider to be, um, be liberal or progressive measures. But in the last three election cycles, those, that has dropped down to either zero or one simply because now it costs, instead of costing maybe $50,000 to get a measure on the ballot in the year 2000, it now costs over 500000 because of these additional um, technical requirements and risks. Mm -hmm. And the Oregon legislature, the Oregon Senate, has already in this session passed a bill that would um, basically criminalize the initiative process. It would take all of these extremely uh, technical rules and regulations about how to collect signatures <coughs> and transform any minor violation, which today is, is penalized by a fine that is limited to $250. It would convert the, each of those minor violations into a Class C felony, which is punishable by five years in jail and a fine of $125,000. That's Senate Bill okay. 154, folks. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we've taken a process which was possible for grassroots organizations to use uh, to have expressions of what they desire for the state and the direction the state should go in. Mm -hmm. uh, you've made it, or they have made it into a process which now only really large organizations with a large amount of money can access. And now with the current legislature, they have proposed changing the initiative rules uh, even further to actually criminalize uh, some of those rules. That's right. Okay. Um, and you might have noticed that in, in the last several election cycles, basically your, your ballot, statewide ballot measures are coming predominantly from folks like casino promoters, uh, coming from folks who want tax cuts, that there's always money out there mm -hmm. for campaigns in order to cut taxes, uh, cut corporate taxes and the taxes of, individu uh, of individuals. Um, and there are rare measures which don't fall into that category. The, the, those measures include such things as there's various types of medical marijuana uh, programs or marijuana legalization, uh, and but uh, and some measures in order in order to, for example, set aside state fund the state lottery funds for parks that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to measures that we used to have on the ballot, like like um, universal single payer health care 
or the required labeling of genetically modified, modified foods, or campaign finance reform for that matter, those have simply not been on, are, are not, don't make the statewide ballot anymore. Okay, and they're not likely to? Not, uh, not without a lot of money behind them, and also um, folks who are willing to, to take the risk of now any minor violation by anyone who works for the campaign is converted into a, a felony of the campaign manager. Mm -hmm. Well, or chief petitioner. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, that gives me pause. <laughs> right. Um, that's right. So even if you are the, the volunteer chief petitioner on a measure, you can be, um, you can be held, you're held responsible. You're conclusively, you're conclusively presumed to, to be the violator if anyone in the campaign violates any laws or right. rules. Right. Yeah. And so uh, wh what's the prospects of this uh, change happening. What You said Senate Bill 159? Senate Bill 154. 154. It went to the floor of the Senate where it passed 16 to 14. All Democrats voting for it. All Republicans voting against it. Uh -huh. So it now goes to the House where it has not been scheduled for a hearing yet. Okay. Uh, and, and it remains to be seen what will happen. But it's a, it appears to be a high priority of the public employee unions. Hmm. And so in the no. House, at least two Democrats Two or three Democrats would have to vote against it. Okay, and uh, why 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 would the unions be particularly um, interested in getting this passed? Well, for the last twenty years, they've been um, very much against um, having an initiative process that is, um, you know, usable basically uh, by by folks other than themselves. Of course, they have the money to use it, um, and so they have been the primary sponsors of the and advocates for um, all of the new laws and rules to make the initiative process more difficult and more risky. Mm. Okay, all right. We have uh, about six minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, you wanted to talk about open meeting laws uh, and nepotism. Uh, you want to just well, also, go for it? Also campaign finance disclosure, since we're still on that subject. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. There is a, a bill that is passed the, um, that is in the House which would um, delay reporting of campaign contributions and expenditures. Now, during the last six weeks before election day, um, all campaign contributions have to be reported within seven days of their, of their receipt. This would change that to 14 days. So it would delay the information to voters on where campaign contributions are coming from. Yeah, in, as originally um, introduced, it would have required reporting within two days during the last 14 days of the campaign, within two days, any contribution above $1,000. But that wouldn't prevent me, for example, from writing out a series of 100 checks for $999 and handing them all to you, the candidate. None of those individual contributions is over 1,000. None of them would be, would be covered. Mm -hmm. So an amendment has been introduced in order to, in order to avoid that loophole. Still, um, that, then they changed that, the reporting for those contributions from two calendar days to two business days, which means up to four calendar days. So it's just that um, I don't think we should be reduced, we would be, should be increasing the time or increasing the delay for reporting any contributions or expenditures. And this bill would still do that by increasing the time for reporting contributions during the last six weeks of the campaign. Instead of reporting within one week, now you have to report it within two weeks. Right. And it's during that past, that last six weeks, or sometimes during the last two weeks, where you get the really large contributions. Right. Right. In addition, there's Senate Bill 145, which has passed the Senate, that repeals the requirement that a corporation with the primary purpose of, get, of engaging in politics report uh, what the sources of its paid-in capital. It's kind of a complex thing, but. What it means is that if a corporation is out there making independent expenditures, Oregon does have a law that says that you have to report where the money came from. Um, and it would come in, in the case of a corporation that's just out there making such spending, it would come from paid in capital because um, for various technical legal reasons. So the Oregon Secretary of State is proposing to eliminate that, which means that you could have 501c4 corporations and other and other for-profit corporations actually making campaign expenditures and not reporting the sources of, of the, where that money came from, and then making the campaign expenditures in the euphonious name, for example, of the you know of the Oregonians for Good Things Corporation. Okay. Inc. So the, this sounds like one case where Oregon law was actually stronger than federal. It was. Law. It is. It is now. It is now, but likely to change. But the it's 
That's right. It pa that law, that proposal passed the Senate uh, rather over overwhelmingly, 27 to 1. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, and finally, um, the Oregon legislature does has been considering bills to basically gut the open meetings law, which requires public bodies to meet in public. Um, that bill was introduced, uh, House Bill 3513, after we found out about it and testified against that it was, it basically is dead. Uh, and also, however, Senate... So there is a little good news. That's a little good news, <laughs> yes. The, the, a bill to gut, to actually require public meetings to continue to be held in public um, did not pass. But House Bill 2079 did pass and was signed by the governor. It changes the definition of relative for the purpose of anti-nepotism laws. In Oregon now, if you're a, a public body like a city council or something, and you're a city council member, if you want to hire your relative for a job or give your relative a contract under the law as it was, be, you know, before this, before now, uh -huh. you would have to disclose that the person is your relative and not participate in, in the decision to hire him or her or or grant the con give the contract. Uh, but that applies to your relatives, and so what this bill has done is changed the definition of relative. So the following persons are no longer your used to be your relatives uh -huh. under the law, but now for nepotism purposes are not your relatives. Your half brothers, half sisters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, stepchildren, brothers-in-law, sisters-in-law, mothers-in-law, and fathers-in-law. So all those folks now can be hired by the public official uh, or granted a contract. With, by the public official taking, taking part in the decision, and the public official need not disclose that the person he's hiring or granting the contract to is, for example, his niece, his uncle, his aunt, his half-brother. Okay. Those aren't relatives anymore. Okay. Well, this is very interesting. Dan, thank you very much for Thanks, being David. our guest today. Great. Uh, don't forget that you can watch Populous Dialogues on YouTube. Go to YouTube.com, search for Populous Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, maybe you can help us expand our viewership. Just contact your local cable access station and see what is required for you to sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local stations are good, are looking for good materials and will welcome the, the suggestion. And they can pick up the program at no cost to them from pegmedia.org. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination and establish true democracy to create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our volunteers who donated their time today. So thank you to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Beth Kerwin, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.